for a quick show of hands about how many people were outraged when they read about what the intelligence community was doing uh, with the, uh, that we found out about with the Snowden leaks. I can't see anybody because I am being blinded by light but I am seeing movement, and I feel like a Tyrannosaurus Rex now. Um, so lots of outrage. All right, who feels like after five years of hard work and millions of dollars put into the privacy community and all of the times you've called your members of Congress and sent emails to them and taken to the streets that we've, we've solved it, right? Like, we're good, right? No, nothing? All right. Um, so in, in June of 2015, which is two years after the first of the Snowden leaks were published, uh, former NSA director Michael Hayden described his reaction to changes made to the Telephone Metadata Dragnet program by the recently passed USA Freedom Act. Uh, Michael Hayden said, and I'm quoting here, and this is it after two years? Cool. There were a lot of dramatic changes after the Snowden leaks five years ago, which I think I don't need to reiterate to this crowd about end-to-end -end encryption, changes in behavior, changes in perceptions about mass surveillance, and so on and so forth. But what did not result from the Snowden leaks was any meaningful limitations on the scope or extent of mass surveillance by the intelligence communities in the United States. Exacerbating this, there has not been a public, let alone a private, debate as to why congressional reform achieved since Snowden, which uh, the short version are the USA Freedom Act, which revised and reauthorized parts of the Patriot Act, including the phone metadata dragnet, and the FISA Amendments Reauthorization Act of, 2015, of 2017, which to give you an idea of the dysfunction that we're facing, that was passed in 2018, despite having 2017 in the name. Um, which reauthorized the FISA Amendments Act covering the now renamed PRISM surveillance program and other programs. These have not meaningfully de decreased either the amount of surveillance that has taken place or the uses that it's been put to. Uh, before I begin this panel, I want to caveat everything by, uh, that I'm going to be saying and that the panelists here are going to be saying uh, by, by talking about the title of the panel, which is the phrase, what went wrong with surveillance reform since Snowden? This is a provocative title, admittedly. Uh, there have been changes, and we'll talk about some of them, although with the time limitations, we won't get to all of them. However, if your goals, which I think all of my panelists here and myself and everybody in this room shares, are to, one, limit the amount of surveillance conducted or its use, or two, to position ourselves so that in the near future, we can limit the amount of surveillance or its uses, we've not succeeded despite immense amounts of public pressure, despite millions of dollars invested into the privacy community in order to re reform surveillance at the national level. So our goal to start this conversation about what needs to change to curtail mass surveillance at a pace that matches the frightening rise of authoritarian ideologies, which will foreclose on the possibility of a free society if given the opportunity and the tools and the infrastructure with which to do so. Uh, with me to jumpstart that debate today are Alex Matthews of Restore the Fourth, which is a 501c4 nonprofit dedicated to ending unconstitutional mass surveillance. Uh, Marcy Wheeler, an independent national security and civil liberties reporter whose writings can be found regularly at emptywheel.net. Uh, and all the way at the end, we've got Sean Vitka, who lobbies Congress on surveillance and internet freedom issues for demand progress. Moderating the panel is myself, Jeff Landale. I'm an inter independent internet freedom organizer and researcher. I've worked with Access Now, the New America Foundation, XLab, and Demand Progress. Um, we don't have a ton of time, so we're going to try to cover a five-year period in 45 minutes now, maybe less, to get some questions in. So the prerequisite to legislative reforms to surveillance is to understand what surveillance is actually occurring and under what authorities and regulations in order to be able to change those authorities and regulations and put a stop to the unconstitutional mass surveillance that we've been aware of for five years or if you were reading about Mike Mark Klein, uh, more than five years, or if you remember COINTELPRO for many, many decades. Uh, so my first question is to Marcy. Marcy, what are some of the failures that you've seen in the policy community to understand what surveillance is actually happening, uh, what's being overlooked, and why aren't we finding these issues? Um, I recently had a conversation with Bob Litt. For those who don't know, he's the general counsel, the former general counsel of ODNI who advised James Clapper back in 2013. It was a good idea to answer Ron Wyden's question about whether the government was collecting on millions of Americans, not wittingly. So I went to Bob recently and I said, Bob, I think you had a strategy of burying the privacy community in transparency. 
And by that I mean, in addition to the Snowden documents, uh, which few people in, in the DC policy community have read, the, um, the government released a ton of documents, some of which are enormously helpful to explain what was actually going on with the phone dragnet and with 702, the, what, what you may know as PRISM, and, um, and nobody read it. Uh, and so I said to Bob, did you bury them um, on purpose? And he's like, well, it's like any analytical thing. Sometimes it's really hard to find the diamond in the rough. And he kind of chortled because he's like that. Um, instead of reading those documents, what the, what the ODNI did at the same time was kind of embrace the privacy community and invite them to the table. And so rather than reading the documents that were a response to Snowden that, and therefore were part of what Snowden basically risked his life to give us, the privacy community in DC uh, enthusiastically sat down at a table with Alex Joel, who's part of ODNI, supposedly the privacy officer, and let him tell them what was going on rather than reading the documents. Thank you, Marcy. Um, a follow-up for um, you, I think, is, is, is this an issue of the quality of the analysts, or are there structural issues war where uh, entire institutions and organizations which have offices dedicated to this are not able to sift through the amount of information and transparency that they're getting in order to come to a solid understanding of what's going on? I think there's a, a theory among the privacy community in DC, many of whom are lawyers, that if 7JD sit down in a room and read the statute, they will understand what's going on. What actually needs to happen, at least in my experience, is people who don't need JDs, I don't have a JD, I do have a PhD, but I don't have a JD, need to sit down and read uh, the minimization procedures, which are basically where FISC tells the government what they're allowed to do. So the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court? Yeah something like that. Um, and, and that never happened. So there are lawyers in New York. That the, I, I mean, there are the only other people who I know of who've read all of the documents that were released by ODNI are some ACLU lawyers, litigators here in New York. I know of no other people in the country with the possible exception, well, with the exception of Laura Donahue, who's now uh, a Fisk amicus. I know of no other people in the country who've read these documents. Instead, some lawyers sit down and read the law and as a result don't understand what's really going on behind the law. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, my next question is to Sean. We're getting legislative proposals that overlook the actual functioning of surveillance in infrastructure, both legally and technologically, and which aren't going far enough to inspire that many people to get involved to get a bill passed. Um, what's going on in, in Congress where we're getting shit bills? <laughs> Um, it's a great question. Uh, so I'm going to tell a story, I think, about the FISA Amendments Reauthorization Act, um, if that makes sense, Jeff. Yep. We, we just lost uh, in a major way earlier this year. Um, the FISA Amendments Reauthorization Act of 2017 um, became law. There is a, a very complicated process that goes into it, and uh, it, it really predates the 702 fight. Again, this is what authorizes PRISM and Upstream. Um, it's born from the USA Freedom Debate, which uh, if you're not familiar with, I would recommend checking out Marcy's readings. Um, but to, to abbreviate this, let's start at the end of it. We in the privacy community often considered the USA Freedom Debate to be kind of the precursor to 702, because as bad as the bulk metadata dragnet uh, was, the use of prism and upstream um, was, was uh, for me at least, uh, much more disturbing. So we worked really hard on this. And we started out very early trying to uh, meet with the intelligence community, meet with the administration, meet with uh, every member of Congress we possibly could. At the end of the day, the people on the Hill decided that uh, in the interest of making sure that a bill that they were working on, theoretically to reform it, would get a vote in committee, which is a necessary step, uh, more or less, uh, that they would have to work with Bob Goodlatte. So Chairman Goodlatte is, uh, is the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and under no circumstances would he be considered an ally of reform. So at the outset, um, we had a very difficult question, and I think we answered it wrong. Uh, we had somebody like Bob Goodlatte in the room deciding what reform was going to go to the floor. 
Now, from the perspective of what can we actually get and, and have a, a debate over in committee, um, there's some sense to that. He is the chairman. If he's on board, he can push it. Um, the problem is uh, that it robs the, the, the grassroots, it robs the activists of the opportunity to actually hold members accountable. Because suddenly the only reform bill that had been um, seriously worked on and vetted um, ends up being the USA Liberty Act, which, for, I'm going to use parlance here, doesn't successfully uh, at introduction close the backdoor search loophole, which was the foundational, the, the, the arch stone of reform for, for us for a long time. And there was a scramble, and we didn't, uh, we were stuck with a, a, an unfortunate choice. Do we abandon ship? Do we leave the only bill um, that seems to have path forward? Uh, and if so, what do we do? Um, some of us did, and Demand Progress, I'm happy to say, uh, absolutely said that it was an unacceptable bill. We end up eventually getting something called the USA Rights Act, not introduced in committee, but um, introduced by Senators uh, Wyden and Paul, and uh, also in the House. USA Rights Act was kind of a gold standard reform bill, um, but everybody told us we could never get a vote on it. Uh, eventually, you end up with USA Liberty getting steamrolled by leadership. Instead, the intelligence community uh, writes a bill with the House Intelligence Committee, um, our good friend Devin Nunes, and they just completely steamroll the Judiciary Committee, and their bill goes to the floor instead. Uh, so USA Liberty never gets a vote. It dies an extremely quiet death after uh, passing out of judiciary. So a lot of good it did us um, organizing and spending all that time working on this bill in tandem with one of our greatest opponents, which is Chairman Goodlatte. Um, so that ends up becoming law. And that, the FISA Amendments Reauthorization Act, ends up uh, expanding the use, for instance, of 702 in court. Uh, against uh, defendants who aren't, uh, you know, accused of terrorism or, or something else. Uh, you can now use it for international narcotics. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty dramatic problem. Um, but we did have this one glimmer of hope. Right before that vote, uh, some of our allies on the Hill managed to get uh, a promise for a vote on the USA Rights Act. And so suddenly this bill that was the gold standard and that nobody, um, that everybody was telling us we couldn't possibly get, um, a vote for gets 183 votes as a replacement to the FISA Amendments Reauthorization Act. You need 218. 183 isn't super close, but that's a winnable fight. But we had never done, we had done an inadequate job of laying the groundwork to get that bill passed. And so we went from a, a situation where we almost had every reform we wanted to an actual degradation of the status quo. Thank you, Sean. Um, and when you say that Everyone was saying that the USA Rights Act, which came reasonably close to passing, couldn't pass. That's including members of the privacy reform community, correct? Yeah, I, um, I, we, we had a letter that, to support the USA Rights Act, and some organizations actually, well, one in particular, uh, explicitly said that they, they wouldn't sign on because they just didn't think it was worth the time. Thank you, Alex. Uh, excuse me. Thank you, Sean. Uh, my next question is to Alex. Um, Alex, you spend a lot of time organizing at the grassroots level. Uh, you are not based in D.C., so you're not beholden to some of the same uh, stringent requirements that uh, those of us uh, there sometimes face. Uh, do you, do you, what are your thoughts on why the grassroots isn't showing up in the same way that perhaps it has for the SOPA PIPA fight or for net neutrality. Why aren't we seeing, if not people taking to the streets necessarily, but the same level of constituent mobilization and phone calls and emails being driven in support of the bills that are being put forward um, in Congress? I think to me it seems a relatively simple analysis I know why I am involved in grassroots organizing, and I know a lot of people who are involved in surveillance organizing, and I have some notion of why they're involved. And as you said at the top of the panel, what motivates us is trying to decrease surveillance. Having more transparency is nice. It can be in an instrument towards that goal. But what motivates us is measures that will decrease surveillance, and that is why we put in the hours that we do. And it seems absurd to pursue a strategy that is so much 
focused on what individual gatekeepers in DC will accept, that you're implicitly premising it on being able to mobilize your own members and being mob able to mobilize people who, to call in, but people won't call in if they don't care. And they won't care if what, if what they're offered is something that is at best a maintenance of the status quo with additional transparency and at worst an actual worsening of the status quo. The, there's a lot of obfuscation in this area, there's a lot of complexity and grassroots activists um, in the main are wanting to have a cause for fight, to fight for and that poses a difficulty. I think that part of what we also see is that there was an overvaluing of the power of this particular gatekeeper and an assumption that Bob Good Goodlatte um, would be able to get not only a bill discussed in committee, but would be able to have enough e um, influence over leadership to have it receive a vote on the floor um, that would be a reasonable vote and that it would have a chance of passage. And I think nobody among the people who were focusing on Congress um, was really thinking about how that would be the case. And how that would be the case is through grassroots pressure. It takes thousands of calls, it takes tens of thousands. And there needs to be a tapping into that energy and a respecting of that energy. Thank you, Alex. Um, I think this, is, this next question is to all three panelists, and you can answer it perhaps rapid fire if you want to go into more detail as well. But how do you respond to the argument that if we can't even get this incremental change, if we can't get the USA Liberty Act, which dies in committee and never gets a four vote, um, how, how are we supposed to be able to get even bigger and bolder and more comprehensive changes? I'll have to take a first crack. So on top of surveillance, I also handle net neutrality. And it is night and day looking at the two. One is a robust, popular movement. And it allows us um, on the Hill to choose our allies, choose who's going to lead the fight, to make demands, and to force people to go on record. Um, if you have a bill that shows up in the middle, you never really get to ask the question, are you pro-warrantless surveillance under Donald Trump or not? That's the question we needed to be asking. Um, I'll highlight, actually, the, the worst moment, in my opinion, uh, of the FISA Amendments reauthorization fight, which was during the House uh, floor debate when USA Rights was being voted on. And uh, Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, um, with the strong backing of uh, Ranking Member Adam Schiff, they took the floor and urged their members to vote against USA Rights. In other words, to preserve warrantless surveillance under Donald Trump. Again, we ended up with 183 votes, but we had Representative Pelosi and Representative Schiff pretty much at the end dominate for the last 10 minutes of debate time, urging Democrats and everybody to not um, pass USA rights. So if we end up in that situation, and we've had a, a middling debate, or a debate about a middling bill like the USA Liberty Act, um, we can't go, uh, we, we don't have the, the groundwork laid. We can't take that razor um, to, the, to the fight and say, which side of this are you on? And instead we find out at the last second that somebody who should be whipping very aggressively in our favor is actually going to shoot us in the foot. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll jump in on this. Um, part of the problem without, about not laying out what is actually being done is that um, I last year in October covered what I now call the Tor exception. It's, it's a secret application of Section 702 that uh, accesses location obscured servers and keeps is allowed to do that even if US persons are using the servers like Tor so long as the NSA gets rid of the US person content after the fact. But there are eight, as Sean said, there are eight enumerated crimes. Some of them are you know, bad, like 
like murder and 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 kidnapping and some of the and child porn and some of them are crimes that are uh, traditionally misunder mi, uh, mis uh, uh, broadly expanded meaning trafficking which is often sex work and CFAA computer fraud and abuse act which is often uh, activism and so the government can now keep stuff from the dark web um, and the bill actually codified it such that in addition to these eight, eight crimes anything that the attorney general meaning Jeff Sessions deems a national security issue so something like say BLM Black Lives Matter they can also keep that under the law as passed last year now I covered that and um, and I uh, it was a very difficult story to write. I covered that. The privacy community pretty much blew it off. Blew it off. And so instead of saying Nancy Pelosi is about to vote, is about to whip to give Jeff Sessions the authority to decide to spy on Black Lives Matter in the name of foreign surveillance, instead of holding Nancy Pelosi accountable for whipping for that bill, we instead were kind of wishy-washing talking about going after terrorists. And that's the importance of being really honest about what these surveillance programs do because Nancy Pelosi was able to pretend that what she did wasn't giving Jeff Sessions unreviewable authority to use these, surve to use these surveillance tools against Americans. And the bill literally says there's no judicial review of the Attorney General's decision, by the way. Uh, Marcy, you've had some other experiences as well with the uh, privacy community perhaps sidelining or actively pushing you out of the conversation when you raise criticisms of the bills that they are rallying around? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, you know, I, I, I can be a jerk, I admit it, and, and I can be strident about what I believe these things to do, but I now, you know, I guessed in 2009 about the phone dragnet four years before Edward Snowden and started a leak investigation because people thought that there was no way I could just guess it. I have a very good track record on this, but it, you know I don't have a JD, so I think people in DC don't like girls from Michigan be stridently saying you need to listen to what the surveillance is actually doing um, because it ruffles feathers, I guess. Some of us do, just, just not enough. <laughs> Uh, I think that's the polite answer from Marcy this time around. Um, Get me drunk later, and I'll. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alex, do you have uh, do you have any any thoughts about why uh, being able to achieve bolder and more comprehensive reform may be a potential route? I'm definitely leading you on with this question towards uh, success rather than middling and, and incremental reform that we've seen over the past five years. I think that to an extent the importance is the choice set that you offer Congress. Um, I wish that Congress were the kind of deliberative body that it is in the imaginations of people who work with these folks day to day and who have to assume that they are motivated by things like rationality. Um, but. Congress is a body in deep disarray, motivated by crisis, that has real difficulty in getting anything done at all. And when it d does something, it does something when it is desperate. As a result, the important thing is not to give congressional leadership stuff that they can get away with is not to come in as the reasonable person in the room and to come with a pre-digested compromise that you think may just about be okay with the people who like you. Um, you have to present them with the catastrophic alternatives in their minds of letting surveillance authorities lapse entirely or giving them deep reform, giving us deep reform. Um, and so I think that privacy organizations need to be very skeptical about presenting to lawmakers something moderate that they have sat down with the intelligence community with and the intelligence community has signed off upon. That is really not our job. We are advocates. We are representing 
people who deeply care about freedom from surveillance, and the bills that we present need to deeply care. Um, now, Congress is more chaotic than it has been. The politics of this are more scrambled than they have been, and President Chaos Monkey um, <laughs> re-scrambles the situation week on week. So we cannot, as maybe we might have been able to do 20 or 30 years ago, re reliably point to somebody like Trey Gowdy and say, oh, we think he's going to vote this way on this, because they are so guided by what they think will piss off the president and what will not. And who, th who knows, week on week, what will piss him <laughs> off and will not? I mean, nobody knows. That presents opportunities for us as a coalition to gum things up, to prevent Congress from doing more damage than it already has, um, but also in the interstices where Congress is not rationally debating, which is probably the majority of its time, um, to push through solutions that, if push comes to shove, they will feel desperate enough to pass. This whole thing about the expiration of surveillance authorities, it is not our problem to solve. The expiration of surveillance authorities is a good thing. And if it happens, then that is good for us. So we should not be coming to them and saying, we will solve this problem for you. Let them explain what they want to do. And let's present what should be done instead. Thank you, Alex. Jeff, do you mind if I? Yeah, jump in. Um, so I think, uh, I strongly agree with what Alex just said. Um, it, it, this conversation and, and what Alex just said point very specifically to, to a theory of change question. And the prime motivator for a member of Congress, for most members of Congress, there are definitely some principled ones. Unfortunately, there are principled ones on both sides. It's the common welfare, right? That's the prime motivator. <laughs> it's fear. It's fear of losing an election. It's fear of pissing off their constituents. This is why having something that mobilizes grassroots is so critical. And if we take the principle that that's our primary leverage and play it out, then the presence of immense grassroots pressure is critical. It's the thing, it's the fuel. Just the car doesn't move otherwise. And I fear, um, again, this has become, for me, very night and day, working between net neutrality and surveillance. Uh, if, we, need members of Congress who will be champions and who will fight to the hilt. And to get those, you have to pick the right allies and you have to do the same. And you have to find out who's going to go which way. You have to present them with that binary choice. That theory doesn't seem to hold up in the surveillance community. On net neutrality, I don't know if anybody's following the California net neutrality bill, for instance, but we had a, a, a row with, with Miguel Santiago, who was the, the chairman of one of the committees. He attempted to gut uh, what seems to be on its way to becoming the strongest net neutrality bill in the country. He backed off real quick once it turned out somebody was thinking about putting up billboards in his district. We need to fight like hell and I don't think that's what's happening. Instead, what's happening are conversations where we are assenting to Chairman Goodlatte being a necessary party, to him being on the bill, to him signing off. We are accepting the idea that the people who do my job, and I will say, the people who do my job are, are unfortunately pretty strapped for, for time and capacity. It is its own issue. Um, but we're not there to negotiate. We're there to find the right allies and to make sure they're as powerful as possible when they have to negotiate. And that requires all of you and all of our grassroots members. Um, instead, the conversation that seems to happen is, is one that accepts that we're going to play the game their way, as Alex just described. In order to achieve, though, this legislative reform, there's 
basic arithmetic that has to happen, though. You need a majority of votes in both of the, um, both of the, both the House of Representatives and in the Senate. Uh, and one of the arguments that's often put forward is that we, for example, for the USA Freedom Act, uh, that was not an overwhelming vote that we got. There were a number of votes, for example, in the House of Representatives that voted against that bill. Um, but I know that there was, perhaps, Sean, you can talk about this, uh, uh, information about why some of those representatives voted against the bill that makes the argument for needing better legislation put forward. So the USA Freedom Act, it's its own long panel. Um, but the way you get to 218 is what we've been describing. The way you get to 60 votes in the Senate is the way we've, way we've been describing. You need that pressure. I mean, there are certain issues where on occasion you can throw a couple people in a room and they'll show up with a decent bill and everybody agrees it passes. It's just not this one. Um, the way you get to 218 is you grind. You, you call every day. Uh, you, you work your ass off to meet with every member of Congress. I have, I will, I, I've done 200 meetings in the last year. Um, you, but those aren't the, that's not the power. That's not what wins the fight. What wins the fight is people calling and constituents making clear that they're not gonna support somebody who, again, and I can't say this loudly enough, supports warrantless surveillance under Donald Trump, and they sure as shit shouldn't accept it from a Democrat. Thank you, Sean. Um, get, some, get some finger snapping there. Where the fuck are the companies on this fight? <laughs> when it, what, so I, um, right before the election, right before the 2016 election, I was actually in Brussels talking to, uh, I was talking to um, EU people who are surveillance champions about what it's like to negotiate with the United States on surveillance knowing you're being surveilled. Was this a discussion over drinks? <laughs> There was lots of beer drank, yes. Um, but, but one of the things that was, you know, it was interesting working on surveillance in Brussels as compared to D.C. because people are like, why the hell are you guys partnering with Google in the United States? Why the hell is Google paying for the privacy community in the United States? That doesn't make any sense. And it is, in fact, the case that Google dumps a lot of money into our allies. I mean, in fact, I, I think I've gotten some money from Google via some of my activities, full disclosure. But um, what that means is that, um, particularly on USA Freedom Act, uh, and the banks, too. Did you know that there's financial collection under, U under uh, Section 215? We didn't talk about that. The banks were really happy to have their role in the surveillance process not discussed at all. And so what the, what the companies did on both of these was say, here's where we want, here's where we're happy to go. We're happy to be PRISM. We're happy, you know, um, Verizon, surprisingly, was actually a reasonably interesting partner on USA Freedom Act, which, don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> but, but, but these companies want to both be key cogs in the surveillance machine, especially Facebook, but also not have consumers know that. And so on both of these fights, they came up with where they wanted to go, and they got some key players, even in the privacy community, to say, okay, this looks like surveillance, so we'll go chase this down. And it helps, I mean, I'll be honest, like, it helps to have Google and Apple behind you when you're fighting surveillance, but it also means also means that uh, some of the deals are being made in Silicon Valley or by really well-paid lobbyists who really just want to be able to tell consumers that they're not a big part of the surveillance cog, the surveillance machine. I. Uh one thing that's important to keep in mind with companies is that uh, the, the leverage that activists have over them is not dissimilar from the leverage you have over members of Congress. Um, and again, if they see an easier way out um, of, of their predicament, like being known as uh, government proxies, then they'll take it. They're happy to take a USA Freedom Act and call it a day. Um, 
you know, I, I, I have some respect for some of the companies, to be clear, but uh, the point of making sure that they have to decide are they pro-surveillance or anti-surveillance um, is really critical. Uh, the way that we see activism going on, for instance, with contracts with ICE, that's amazing work. I don't do it, so kudos to whoever is. But that kind of pressure looks very similar to the kind of pressure we're talking about needing um, on members of Congress. Can I build on that a little Please. bit? Yes. Um, I think that there are um, a few elements that can help to provide positive change here. Um, I think that we can draw lessons from the enormous progress that we have made as a society on social issues such as marijuana, um, such as um, LGBT rights, um, and we should look at and model the role of local organizing and local initiatives at the municipal and state level to rein in the surveillance state, to gain police accountability, to talk about how um, the surveillance state feeds into the ICE deportation machine. Um, and on a macro level, race by race, to be looking at which of these representatives are our friends of surveillance on, on surveillance and which are not, and doing the job that is very difficult for a 501c3 in DC to do, which is identifying candidates to run against those people and scare the bejesus out of them. Uh, and I, I'm going to jump ahead and make Jeff really pissed at me, but um, one of the other things about the companies that's really key is one of the most important surveillance activists in the United States is a guy who's not in the United States by the name of Max Schrems. Mm. Max is an Austrian lawyer who keeps creating havoc in the EU for agreements that Facebook and Google and Apple make uh, uh, for the privacy of EU citizens, and he is relentless and successful. And that has given us more leverage in the United States than almost anything else, because Facebook and Google and Microsoft need to look like they are not surveilling EU citizens, where privacy actually is a big uh, political issue. Um, and so that's actually more, a better source of leverage right now than anything in the United States, which is how pathetic we are. Jeff, so, go ahead. Um, so I want to highlight something that Alex just said. Uh, th there is a, it's been a hard few years on the surveillance fight, to be clear, uh, as I'm sure you know. Um, but what Alex just described, um, including finding people or running yourself um, to just challenge people. Uh, there is an empowering note here. DC has to do a better job of giving you something to fight for. But at the end of the day, I, I, I want to dispel a myth that I sometimes, that I frequently hear, that it doesn't matter to call a member of Congress. Um, we, we should probably be doing workshops, to be honest, about how to effectively engage Congress, but I promise you it does matter. I know, I mean, again, ask Miguel Santiago. Um, the, the calls, the meetings, showing up, getting politically active, the key is escalation. The key is you ask nicely, and then when they say no, you ask again, and then when they say no, you run against them. You put up a billboard. You start finding votes. Um, and if you can escalate that way, you will get their attention, and you can shift the debate that way. And if we can't win tomorrow, or we didn't win last year, the key is to be building momentum so that we win next time. I'm going to skip the remaining few questions that I've got to get to the end because I'm hoping to squeeze in a few questions from folks and we're running out of time here. Um, this might be a deep level of cynicism in me talking, but I think we face the very real possibility that with the expiration of Section 215 of the Patriot Act coming up, we might find ourselves in a situation where there's pre-compromise within Washington, D.C., and where the reform bill that the privacy community that has been taking the lead on this rallies around is utter shit. And we need to be put into a position where we can give you, the folks in, in, uh, who are watching this, and everybody in your community, something, as Sean said, that we can rally around, that we can get excited about, that we can invest our time and energy and pay attention to. Uh, so I want to ask each of these panelists, uh, starting with Sean at the end and moving down, 
what's achievable in the next two years? What can we fix within the privacy community in order to be able to be in a position where we can have bills that are really worth fighting for and have the infrastructure in place to be able to win those fights? There are a lot of different fronts that, that, that would answer this question. Um, I'm going to flag a, a colleague of mine, my boss actually, Daniel Schumann, who's also at Demand Progress, who does amazing work on oversight, on uh, changing the mechanics, on changing who sits on these committees, who's running the committee that we so dearly need. Um, why isn't Representative Amash, who's actually great on surveillance, why isn't he on House Judiciary Committee? Um, things like that are, are, are critical for the long-term fight. Um, we can make those changes in the short term. Um, there are ways to change the rules of the House that make a big difference, for instance. But in terms of uh, an activist, um, hey, man, it's, it's 2018. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the end of the world if uh, things don't change. Um, so I think you all know the answer to it. It's just not easy. Um, we need to go. We need to get out. We need to vote. We need to make it an issue. Um, in terms of 215 specifically, uh, honestly, make sure the organizations that, that you support or like or work for um, are vocal, are as engaged as they can be. Uh, having companies call members of Congress is a huge deal. It makes a big difference. And if it's an organization that either you work for or you support, um, I, it's, it's hard to get to this level of detail. Marcy does a very good job, so reading emptywheel.net is, uh, is a pretty good option. But um, make sure that they're supporting the right things. Make sure they're supporting reforms that you believe in. Make sure that they're not um, going to, frankly, sell you out. I do not walk into meetings expecting compromise. Thank you, Sean. I should say that one of the most important things is to not get lost excessively in the partisan patterns of politics. Because we have a situation where we have a, a president who I personally despise, who is doing some terrible things, but where there are significant allies for surveillance who are Republicans there are significant enemies of surveillance reform who are Democrats. And it is important for us to grasp that sometimes on this particular issue, the party label is not the most important thing. And the, we need to work with our friends on this issue wherever we can find them. Um, if restore the Fourth, for which I'm the chair, is a non-partisan movement, and we welcome people of all peaceful political persuasions. We, and we have anarchists and libertarians and progressives and all sorts of people. We have people who voted for Trump. We have a, a track record in knowing that it works to put together campaigns and to have people work together across party lines, and we need that a little bit now. One thing that I think we, we have done better in recent years is beginning to reframe who surveillance is about. So every time we have these bills, people come out and say, this is about Al-Qaeda. This is about Osama bin Laden. And in fact, these surveillance programs that we're talking about probably target Chinese Americans more than they target Muslims, which is surprising, but it's a spying bill. And there have been a number of, there have been some really high profile cases, so one's a professor from Temple, Professor Xi from Temple, where Chinese Americans engaging in perfectly legal, perfectly safe discussions about technology have been prosecuted downstream from these surveillance programs. And so one thing that we've started doing is saying this is about Chinese Americans actually talking to Chinese people and that's legal and it should not be surveilled. Um, it is a very brown 
portfolio of people who are spied on. It's it's not just Muslims. It's not just South Asians and, and Arabs. It's not Chinese Americans. It's Latinos, as Sean said, increasingly used against narcotics. It's it's. Um, but the more that we put faces to the impact of this surveillance, uh, the more we have stories to tell that are going to get people out. To, I mean, Nancy Pelosi, 20% of Nancy Pelosi's constituents are Chinese American, and they are targeted under 702 more than probably anybody else. And that's the kind of story we, I think, have increasingly been telling, and the more we can tell those stories, the more successful we're going to be. Thank you all so much. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, I just want to reiterate for folks, questions are under 30 seconds long and end in a question mark, often indicated by a rise in inflection, and are a request for information. Uh, I also know that um, at least one of our panelists has some uh, released some very dramatic and uh, life-changing news recently. But congratulations, Alex, for your new child. Please only ask <laughs> questions about surveillance reform, though. Thank you. So first, I'd like to say thank you for doing the talk and the work that you do. Um, so I find a problem that I have often is that I talk to a lot of my friends, and they look, like, look at me like I have a tinfoil hat on when I try to explain like, the threats involved with a lot of this stuff. What recommendations do you have for conveying like the, the real risks that we face um, to common people who are non-techies and you know maybe not as interested as they should be? I think one way to convey it to them is a lot of the descriptions of what Facebook collects on you. I mean, here's the rule, right? If Facebook collects it, the government is going to get it, and so. A lot of the discussion of, say, Cambridge Analytica or the psychographics or what have you, um, all of that stuff that Facebook or Google or whoever is doing, um, that's precisely the kind of the spying that the government is doing. But the government can put you in prison. They're not trying to sell you toothpaste. They're trying to put you in prison. And so I think if you use those descriptions of surveillance, and frankly, the, the, the really ominous cases, if you look at some of the stuff China's doing, on the same kinds of surveillance, particularly targeting um, uh, certain communities in China, th that's, the technology is all there here. And we now have a leader who is an authoritarian, uh, at least intent. And so I think if you say, you take Facebook, you take the kinds of applications that China is doing on spying like all day on people who are viewed as dissidents, and that's where we could be in the very, very new future with the, with the surveillance infrastructure in place. We have another question. So to Sean's point uh, about you know the comparison of SOPA and the net neutrality battle, uh, my thought is that in that case it's about stuff. People, uh, if you threaten to take away people's stuff, they go crazy. Uh, and, you know, they perceive that, you know, if they're going to uh, imagine they're going to lose their Netflix or they're not going to be able to have read it as we know it, then people will react. Uh, to uh, Jeff's point about the companies, no, I feel nothing gets done in this country unless it cuts into somebody's ledger somehow. And it, if that means that uh, we partner with Google or we find more honorable partners like, let's say, DuckDuckGo, who is, uh, is in the business of privacy, has in, put an enormous amount of money into privacy activism already. My question for you is, how do we get people pissed off to the point that you said that, you know, if, if politicians actually start to feel threatened, how do we get people feeling like that? Uh, well, one, I think we're out of time, but uh, Alex, do you want to go first by chance? <laughs> I think that people really, I don't think people are simply motivated by what is on their leisure or what's in their pocketbook, though that does matter very much. Um, I think people do not want to see their communities torn apart. And we see that around ICE activism right now. They do not want to see kids suffer. They do not want to see one ethnicity or one set of people in life set against another and treating each other like enemies. 
And I think that there is great scope in focusing on the inherently dehumanizing nature of surveillance and the ways in which it is creating a nation of petty informants with us even unintentionally conveying data about each other to the more of the surveillance state. This is not a future that people want, okay? We talk to people and this is not a future that anybody wants. It's a matter of personalizing it down to people's communities and making it matter in that sense to the people they see every day. Thank you. I believe we are out of time. Uh, and there's another panel coming up after us. So a big thank you and a round of applause for our panelists here. Thank you all so much for coming.